Now, K-pop fans are grieving the loss of one of the biggest stars, Sully. She was found dead in her home in Seoul. She was just 25. And so in the past, when there have been some negative you know, stories coming out, especially about the K-pop industry, I know it's a big trend right now, um, there's been a lot of sensationalism. There's been a lot of, you know, there's this glitzy, glamorous uh, celebrity industry that looks so great on the outside, but there are negative things on the inside. And so there have been a lot of news stories that, that basically say that there's this dark side to the K-pop industry and it sounds so, so sensational, you know. But the fact remains that this is a problem. Mental health issues are a problem that are faced all over the world, including by celebrities in the U.S. and the U.K. and around the world. Thirty years on and uh, billions of toxic exchanges later, uh, it's left us all asking why. What purpose does the online comments section serve and for who? You see, when we rage about something, when we really get upset, when we really rage inside, what we're doing is revealing that there's something deeply sinful inside of us that we're refusing to confront. Now, it's easy for you and me, from our 21st century vantage point, to look back on these first century religious leaders and say, what a bunch of stinking hypocrites. But I wonder how many of us would meld in easily with them. I think we have to ask the question, what about me? How do I react when confronted with information, especially about myself, that I don't like, especially about yourself that you don't like. Now, I know you guys, that never happens to you. Boy, it's quiet here. <laughs> but listen to how Solomon put it in Proverbs. Proverbs 10, he said, whoever ignores correction leads others astray. In chapter 12, he said, the man who ignores correction, hates correction, is stupid. He says he comes to poverty and to shame. Chapter 15, he will die. And again, that man despises himself. And finally, in verse, chapter 29, verse 1, he says, a man who remains stiff-necked after many rebukes will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. On the positive side, he says in chapter 10 of Proverbs, he who heeds discipline shows the way of life. Chapter 15, he adds, is honored. He gains understanding. He goes on to say, he who listens to a life-giving rebuke will find himself at home with the wise. A life-giving rebuke. You see, many of us, life-giving and rebuke don't belong in the same sentence. But there's something invaluable when we allow people to speak the truth into our lives. And even though it's painful to hear it, we listen to it and receive it. You don't really change or grow or mature or progress in your life as a person or even as a follower of Jesus unless you allow yourself to come under correction. Why do we get angry? <laughs> well. I say the, first, the worst thing we can do when we are criticized, even unfairly, is to react in anger. Because no matter how unfair the criticism is, there's always a grain of truth to be found, even in something that's absolutely untrue. If you tell me, well, it's absolutely a lie and there's no truth whatsoever, then I know that you're not being honest with yourself. There's some degree of truth in there. But in contrast, this men, instead of repentance, we find them raging. Now, what does the word rage mean? <laughs> well, it's different from anger by degree, at least. It's, it's a violent, intense, forceful eruption of anger. And we often talk about the anger is slowly rising. Rage is not, does not slowly rise. It explodes, it erupts, it comes up uh, unforeseen. The definer goes on to say, a person who is in a state of rage loses their capacity for rational thought and reasoning. And they usually act violently on their impulses, attacking until the source of their rage has been destroyed. 
As I said, unlike anger, rage doesn't rise, it erupts when a person feels threatened in terms of their pride, their position, their ability to deceive others, or their self-deceptive beliefs. Those are four very interesting things because as we look at these men that are killing Stephen, we realize that they struggled on all four of these accounts. Their pride, literally their status, was threatened by what he said. It essentially, if he, they agreed to what he said, they had to admit their own fallibility and lack of qualification for the positions that they had worked so hard to attain all of their life. In fact, Jesus in Matthew 23 said of them, he says, everything they do is done for men to see. The thirdly, when they can no longer deceive, deception is really about control. Matthew 23, 15, Jesus said, Woe to you, teachers of the law. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much the son of hell as you are. I don't know why that upset them when he said that. But you see, when people are used to being in control and they see the authority to control being taken away from them, Again, what happens is, is anger and the rage that comes with it begins to express itself. And then finally, self-deception. None of the other three things can happen without being self-deceived. We call it rationalization or justification or vindication. Augustine once wrote, he said, God, deliver me from the sin of vindication, of vindicating myself pleading my own cause, pleading my own innocence, talking about the injustice. God, deliver me from that sin, he said. Someone once put it, put it really cleverly. I, I like this a lot. It says, if anger helps you feel in control, no wonder you can't control your anger. If anger makes you feel like you're in control, no wonder you can't control your anger because we all want to feel that we're in control. And the answer is that if God is in control, then I can rest in Him and not feel that I have to be in control. See, anger is nothing more than a mask for our fears, often the fear that someone else is saying something to us that is true. And it's important because we often treat anger as a primary emotional response. It's not actually, it's a secondary emotional response. We start with fear. That's our primary emotional response. And when we feel fear, we have two responses. We said fight or flight. We either want to run away from it or we want to stand up and fight. Usually if we feel like we're you know, boxed in and we have no escape, then we strike out. And, and the problem is, is once you use anger and rage to deal with situations, you realize that you can actually control moments, although you're destroying your life long term. You can control that moment. And that's the, that's the problem with it, because have you ever noticed when you get really angry, people back away? Because anger is a terribly threatening and intimidating emotion. And yet, as they back away, they start staying away. And there's nothing lonelier than being an angry person. In fact, the proverb says, don't associate with somebody who's angry. Don't hang out with them. Because it says, what happens? They'll make you angry too. That's called cable news. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking about the, the whole lot. <laughs> Chuck Swindoll, I'll put it this way, and I'll... I'll I'll draw it to a close here. He said, if you are prone to anger, it might be wise for you to ask yourself what you're afraid of. He says, I have found that brutal, brutal people are often driven by fear. Fear of loss, fear of humiliation, fear of exposure, fear of weakness, and fear of losing control. I can tell you, I can testify that every time I found myself getting angry and losing control, that one of those factors was what was really driving me. I've met people who have been angry their entire lives. And the older they get, the angrier they get. And it's just sad because they 
almost always have so much to be thankful for.